How's it going, everyone? How's it going, everyone? Hope everyone had a good weekend and uh, was able to relax a little bit at least. Uh, good to see everyone here already. That's awesome. Um, first thing, are there any questions over the homework that I signed on Wednesday last week? No, it's not to be turned in. It's just for practice, but uh, I do hope you you attempt all the problems and at least work out how to f solve all the problems. Yeah. So are there any of these problems that you wanted me to go over? Let me know now. Uh, I, oh, and I meant to get a calendar ready, but I was, uh, was super lazy on Friday, so I apologize for not doing that. Um, the first test will be over chapters one and two, probably, you know, about two weeks away at this point, so don't worry about it too much, but, uh, we'll, we'll, we'll get there. Forty-five? Okay, in problem 45, we're, we're meant to solve this with the quadratic formula. So we'll uh, go ahead and use a equals 1, b equals negative 4, and c equals negative 1. So negative b, opposite of b, would turn that into a positive 4. b squared, if we square a negative 4, it's positive 16. 4 a c so we'll plug in a is 1 c is negative 1 and then 2 times a 2 times 1 will just be a 2 on the bottom so from here we now simplify what is underneath the square root you'll see that we have two negative signs here we were 16 minus 4 times 1 times minus 1 so the two negative signs are going to make that a positive. So we end up with 16 plus 4 times 1 times 1. 4 times 1 is 4 times 1 again is still 4. So this term here is going to be 16 plus 4. So we go ahead and combine that together. So we get 4 plus or minus the square root of 20 divided by 2. Now, that simplifies the radical. The next thing we have to do is, work, you know, we, what's under the radical, we have to simplify the radical itself next. Now, square root of 20, if you remember, we want to split up this number 
to where it's a product of a perfect square and some other number. And we know that 4 is a factor of 20, and 4 is a perfect square. So we can express that as 4 times 5 under the radical. And so we have 4 root, or, or square root of 4 times 5. Now, we can complete the square root of 4. We know that's 2. But we cannot take the square root of 5 and come up with a whole number value. So we'll leave the 5 under the square root. Okay. Now at this stage, you know, we have 4 plus or minus 2 square root 5, and then it's all divided by 2. So this 2 in the bottom, we can divide into both terms. So that'll be 4 divided by 2 is 2, and 2 divided by 2 is 1. So make it 2 plus or minus 1 square root of 5. Now, 1 times the square root of 5, we can also call that uh, just the square root of 5. And that would be a good way of expressing that answer. The, the 1 is not entirely necessary since it's implied to be there already. Hope that was helpful. All right, all right. Um, number seventy five. Okay, so we have 9x squared minus 30x plus 25 is equal to 0. Now in problem 75, the instructions are a little bit different than what we had in 45. Here, they only want us to find with the value of the discriminant. So we want to find b squared minus 4ac. And once we calculate that value, we'll go ahead and interpret that result. What does that tell us? then about the uh, equation. What kind of solutions do, do we expect it to have at that point? So we don't actually need to solve all the way for x, even though we, we completely could, because we can just use the quadratic formula like we did in the previous uh, 40, number 45 that we worked. But then we have to make sure we pay attention to the instructions. So b squared, or b value is negative 30, minus 4, a is 9, and c is 25. Now, this expression, the discriminant, is what's actually right under, underneath the radical in the quadratic formula. But ultimately, its value, whether it's positive, 0, or negative, tells us the types of solutions to expect in a given equation. So we go ahead and complete these operations. We have negative 30 squared, which is 900. And then 4 times 9 times 25, which is also 900, it turns out. Um, and so we end up getting 0 as the value of our discriminant. Now we know that if our result is, is positive, then we, we have... two real solutions. If our result is zero, 
Then we have one real solution. And if our result is less than zero, then we have zero real solutions. And in this case, instead of having two real solutions, we'll have two complex solutions. So even though we haven't talked about complex numbers or imaginary numbers just yet, that's the reality of this less than zero result. Now, in this case, we did get a value of zero. Absolutely, you'll be able to use a calculator. The shortcut here is 4 times 25 is 100. 100 times 9 is 900. Anyway, but yes, you can use a calculator. Um, and then equal when it's equal to zero, we said it's one real solution. So we'll write that down as our interpretation of the solutions of this example. One real, and, and technically it's a repeated solution if we want to be a little bit more specific. Were there other questions? Okay. Forty-nine, okay. No, only in the final exam you should expect to be proctored, so if you need to get a webcam, then you don't have to do it until then. And as I mentioned um, a week ago, um, for the final exam, there is an option of doing the ex uh, exam proctored face-to-face -face in our uh, with our math lab people uh, proctoring. Um, Hopefully the, the the state of the world is in a better place, that that's a reasonable thing to try, but uh, yeah. But we'll, we'll certainly have uh, online proctoring available also, but it does require a webcam for that. I wonder if you can use your phone. Hmm. Anyway. However, you would normally complete it, like a, a Zoom meeting, for instance. Anyway, so 49, uh, same as 45, or similar to 45, we just want to plug in our values to uh, the quadratic formula. And so. In this case, our variable is y, so y equals. Now, negative b, opposite of b, is positive 1, plus or minus. And we have a square root, b squared, negative 1 squared, so positive 1, minus 4, times a, 4, times c, 2. And then this is divided by 2 times a, which is 8. making sure I got the signs right. Okay. Now I can already see 
the issue here is because when we complete this under the radical you're going to end up with a negative 31 and so at that point rather than worrying about the, the fact that the square root of negative 1 is actually imaginary the book will probably say if you check your answers that uh, there are no real solutions which is technically true there are no real solutions it turns out both solutions in this case are complex or imaginary and so uh, we're going to look at this type of problem in a little more detail today how we would actually work this out and get our solution uh, because we know the answer is not just there aren't any real solutions we know we should be able to go further than that uh, but that's our discussion for today section or for today section 1.3 Are there any other questions? ball is thrown vertically upward from the top of a building 96 feet tall with an initial velocity of 80 feet per second. The distance s in feet of the ball from the ground after t seconds is s equals 96 plus 80t minus 16t squared. So that's our formula for the height. S is the height of the ball. T is the number of seconds that have uh, taken place. Um, A, what uh, or after how many seconds does the ball strike the ground? So if it hits the ground, then we can infer that its height must be zero feet off the ground. So in this case, we'll say S has to be zero in order for the ball to hit the ground. Because if it's hitting the ground, then it's zero feet, a distance of zero feet from the ground. So we'll just set the whole thing equal to zero, basically. Yes, sorry about that. I, I just noticed myself. Um, now we look at this equation and it, it's quadratic. We have a, a t squared. Anytime the variable is squared, we know this is a quadratic equation. And so we could use the quadratic formula, but this one's actually factorable if we get it into a good format. And even if we don't, we have to be careful about using the quadratic formula because if we were to do that, then A would be negative 16, B would be 80, and C would be 96. What's confusing about this equation is that the, the order that the terms have been written in is kind of reversed from how we would normally see it. Normally we would say negative 16 T squared first, plus the 80 T second, plus the 96 third. So one thing it's good to go ahead and do depending and and this well it doesn't really depend on what method we use this would be a good thing to do in general is make sure we get the terms in the right order from the highest exponent term and then in descending order from there now 
we don't really want t squared to have a negative exponent so we're going to factor a negative out of everything but then we look at the 16 and the 80 and the 96 and we think about do those have a a common factor beyond just wanting to take out the negative like i said um, and it turns out that 16 is actually the common factor there. So if we factor out a negative here, it's going to be instead of negative, positive, positive, it'll be a positive, negative, negative. So basically change all three of those signs by factoring out a negative. And then we also go ahead and take a 16 out at the same time, which you know, leaves a 1 t squared, or just t squared. 80 divided by 16 leaves a 5. 96 divided by 16 is 6. And so, we have t squared minus 5t minus 6 inside the parentheses. Now we can factor this expression more easily once we get all those larger numbers factored out. Since they had all those large numbers in common. So we think about, okay, what combination of numbers multiplies to negative 6 and adds to negative 5? Well, that's going to be uh, negative 6 and positive 1. So negative 6 times positive 1 is negative 6. Negative 6 plus 1 is negative 5. So it meets both criteria that we have. And so that's going to be our factorization. So we're going to have 0 equals um, and we'll have t minus 6 as one factor and t plus 1 as the other. Okay. And so that's going to give us two solutions. t equals 6 and t equals negative 1. Okay. Now, we have two solutions, but really only one of them can be true. So let's think about this problem. T is the amount of time or the amount of seconds that have uh, elapsed since the uh, ball was thrown, since the object was thrown. So is it more reasonable to say it took six seconds to hit the ground or negative one seconds to hit the ground? And so we know we, we can't throw the ball backwards in time. So we're going to eliminate that one. Yeah, so it has to be 6. Okay. So that was part A. Now, the second part says... Get a new sheet. So our second part says, how long does it take for the ball to pass the top of the building on its way back down? Well, if it passes, let me write that down real quick. If it passes the top of the building, it must be at the same height as the building, which is that the height must be 96 feet. Since the building is 96 feet tall, the moment that the height of the ball is equivalent to that is the, the value that we're looking for. <laughs> so we would take our equation, instead of plugging in s equals zero like we did before, we'll plug in 96. So 96 will equal 96 plus 80t minus 16t squared. 
So it's the same equation, but now we set it equal to 96. Now the good thing about this problem is it actually ends up being a little bit easier than the last one. And that's because we have 96 on both sides. So if we want to take this 96 and subtract it over to the left, for instance, or vice versa, subtracting 96 from both sides effectively cancels out both numbers. And so we end up with the equation 0 equals 80t minus 16t squared. Now, if it's not a trinomial, we no longer have the constant value here. Instead of doing a full factorization, like with two binomials, like we have been doing, in this case, it's actually an easier factoring problem because now we can just take out the common factor on both parts. Now, we already established that 16 is the common number here. So that's the same thing that we factored out before. But now both of our terms have a t in common. So let's factor out 16t. So we have 16t times 5 minus t. Now, if we wanted to, we could switch the order of these terms and say negative 16t plus 80t. Either way is fine in this case because it doesn't really affect the outcome. When we have the trinomial, we don't want the negative t squared because it makes the factoring more difficult when we factor into two binomials. With, with this process, just taking out a common factor from the two terms, we don't have to worry about if the order is correct. Sometimes it is more helpful if it is, but it's not strictly necessary, it turns out. Now, I want to... Uh, show you something a very uh, a very important uh, difference between these two uh, parts A and B. In part A, we factored out a negative 16, but we didn't really consider that as affecting our answer because here we had t equals 6 and t equals negative 1. Because we have negative 16 outside, basically we're saying negative 16 is equal to 0, which is impossible. not possible for negative 16 to be equal to 0. There's two completely different numbers and there's no solution there. So what that really means is that in order for there to be a solution it has to have a t that we can solve for. We solve t equals 6, we solve t equals negative 1. There's no t out here so there's nothing to solve for. It ends up being a false or impossible result. Now in a current situation, we do have a t on the outside. So we can say 16t is equal to 0, or 5 minus t is equal to 0. Now here, 16t equals 0, let's divide both sides by 16. that cancels out the 16 on the left, so t equals, and then 0 divided by anything is still 0. So we get t equals 0 seconds as one solution, and we can add the t here so that we end up with uh, 5 equals t, so basically t equals 5 seconds. So it's either 0 seconds or 5 seconds. Now, technically at time zero, the ball is at the top of the building, but that's because we haven't thrown it yet. Time zero is the moment that this process begins. Our question is, when does the ball pass the top of the building on its way back down? So we've already thrown it upwards, and now we're waiting for it to come back down to the ground. So in this case, it'll take five seconds to go up, and then come back down and pass the building before it hits the ground. Uh, hopefully you'll find that helpful. Is that 
Makes sense. Yeah, it hasn't really gone anywhere yet at zero, so we can't say it's past the top of the building exactly. Yes, it only takes one more second to go from the top of the building to the ground level, and that's because the velocity that the ball has at that point is so fast that it, um, yeah, it only takes one more second to get to the ground. It covered that last 96 feet, um, which means you wouldn't really want to be standing in the way of this thing as it hits the ground. Yeah, in reality, if we uh, look at this problem, let's see. Um, I mean, it'll take two and a half seconds to reach its maximum height. Let's see, that would be... Um, 2.5 squared negative 16 plus 80 times 2.5 plus 96 it actually reaches a maximum height of 196 feet um, and by the time five seconds have passed, the gravity is acting on the ball the entire time. It's actually moving pretty quickly. Um, at five seconds, it has a velocity of 64 feet per second um, as it's passing the top of the building, but it's still accelerating. That's why it only takes one more second to cover that last 96 feet. This is a more of a physics question at this point. It is, it is kind of a strange one, yeah. When you when you first look at it, it's pretty strange. Okay, and Gabriel wanted to see one more like that. believe we still have 102 although problem 102 is not quite as interesting because it's not factorable it's going to take a lot more work um, unfortunately I don't have a real easy problems to to do for that one right now uh, I did work one Last week, although I, we didn't do the passing the top of the building aspect, I just did when it hit the ground. Um, hmm. I'll probably think of one. Yeah, something like that. Um, so, we could say our uh, height 
s is uh, negative 16t squared plus 48t plus 64. And this is the scenario where the height of the building is 64 feet tall and this, the ball is thrown upward with a speed of 48 feet per second initially and we do have gravity acting on the ball as well which is what the negative 16t squared indicates. So all three of these pieces come from the, the physical aspects of a falling object and how, and how gravity and, and things like that influences location. So if we wanted to figure out, you know, when does the height equal zero? Okay, we plug in zero for S and then once we set equal to zero, we basically would take out that negative 16 again, like we did in this example, and we end up with t squared minus 3t minus 4, and we'd factor that and get two solutions, one of which was positive and one of which was negative. Well, we want the positive solution, of course, because uh, we want to see how much time has passed in order for the ball to hit the ground. Now, for it to cross the top of the building again, we would say 64 equals negative 16 t squared plus 48 t plus 64. So here we would find that uh, it either takes four seconds to hit the ground or negative one seconds to hit the ground. So we know it takes four seconds to hit the ground. Now, when it passes the top of the building, which is 64 feet tall in this scenario, you know, we would plug in the 64 for the height once again. And uh, what's going to happen is we're going to see those 64s cancel out. Once again, we'll want to factor out, oh, sorry, uh, we'll want to factor out the uh, the negative 16 or, or actually no we just need a common denominator at this point uh, but if we wanted to factor out a negative 16 t we know both numbers have uh, our multiples of 16 and both have at least t to the first power so we can factor that out and that leaves t minus 3 inside and so Uh, one other thing I want to look at in, in the process of doing this question. Back here when we said 16t was our factor on the outside, so we set it equal to 0. We divided by 16, it was still 0. Basically, any time that we have t on the outside like this, it means t equals 0 is going to be one of our solutions, and then whatever else we get from the parentheses. So it's just a, a t that we factor out that autom automatically means t equals 0. And so we're going to end up with the same scenario here, that t is equal to 0 from this first term, and then t equals 3 from the second one. And so either it takes 0 seconds or it takes 3 seconds to cross the top of the building, so it should be t equals 3 seconds in this case. Sorry for rushing through that a bit, but hopefully that makes sense. Okay. Are there other questions? So today we're going to look at, oh, sorry, oh, do we have to plug that back in in order to find the height? Actually, we don't in this scenario because we started off with the concept that we're already at a height of 64 feet. We're just determining how long it takes to come back to that point after we've thrown the ball upward. So we already know that the ball is 64 feet off the ground. 
we just don't know how many seconds it took to reach that point. So we don't actually have to plug that back in. Um, if we wanted to find the maximum height of the ball, like how far up the ball goes before it starts falling back down, that's a problem we'll work a little bit later on, a couple of chapters ahead of us. Um, but in that scenario, we will have to take our answer and then plug it back in because we don't know how high it will, will get. We can at least figure out first how many seconds it will take to get there, which is one of the nice things about the uh, using the algebra to solve some of the basic physics aspects here. Okay. So our goal this week is to get through section 1.4, uh, but we'll, we'll have to do 1.3 and 1.4 between today and Wednesday. Section 1.3 is on complex numbers. And when we talk about complex numbers, the, the main thing here is that, well, before we even get to complex numbers, actually, let's talk about imaginary numbers. Now, when we talk about imaginary numbers, I don't know if it's a great name for these things, but it's the name that was given to them, and that's how we teach it. I think it doesn't do it a lot of, uh, it, it does it a bit of a disservice when we call them imaginary, because we feel like, well, if they're just imaginary, they're made up numbers, we don't have to worry about that. But that's really not the case. And we have applications in, in higher mathematics that rely on, on imaginary numbers. Even though the imaginary numbers don't end up really being as part of the solution, they end up being an important part of the process in some cases. And so that's something that we do need to be aware of, especially if you plan to continue in the uh, sciences or in mathematics. So, we begin, now we don't really do anything else this semester with the measuring numbers, we just kind of, you know, introduce or, or, or go over again some of the, the basic concepts here. Um, by the time you need them again, you'll be so far along in your, your education that it'll be a lot easier to manage. You'll be, you'll welcome the opportunity to work with something that's a little bit more simple, actually. Um, at least that was, that was true in my experience. Um, anyway, so imaginary numbers are established as square roots of negative values. Or square roots of negative numbers. Okay, and so we assign the value of i as being equal to the square root of negative 1. So this is our kind of our basic imaginary unit. Okay, so if we use i equals the square root of negative 1, then for example, if we want the square root of negative 25. Well, we know from our previous discussion, we can split that up as 25 times negative one. And we know that we can take the square root of 25. That's just gonna give us a five. And now we know we can take the square root of negative one square root of negative 1 is equal to i. So we would say the square root of negative 25 is actually 5i. And in general, the way that we approach this is, 
if this is like a, a perfect square, for instance, so if we have negative square root of negative 49, then we take the normal square root of 49, which is 7, and just put an i with it to account for the fact that it is imaginary and that we have the negative underneath. So we don't have to do this middle step, but the middle step kind of helps us see where that number comes from. So it's nice to, to understand where it comes from, but it's not always necessary to write it down each time. Okay. So if we said square root of negative 24, well, again, 24 is not a perfect square. So as we discussed last time, we still want to simplify this as best as we can. So we think about what uh, what perfect squares are factors of 24. Now, remember our perfect squares, let me use the margin over here. Our perfect squares are uh, 2 squared is 4, 3 squared is 9, 4 squared is 16, we have 25, 36, 49, 64, and so on. So any of these numbers that happen to be factors of this number over here, the, the negative 24, or the 24, we want to factor out the largest one possible from that list of perfect squares. Now, what we'll find is most of the time it's probably just going to be a 4 or a 9, occasionally a 16, usually not larger than that. So we, we keep the numbers relatively sane so that we don't have to always run to a calculator to to get the answers um, but if you if you want to use a calculator just to double check what you've done that's perfectly acceptable so we end up splitting this up as negative 4 times 6 um, now what is the, what is the square root of negative 4 incorporating the negative Two i, good. So negative four, the square root of negative four becomes two i, and then we can't really do anything else with the six. So the six is still under the square root, and so the square root of negative twenty-four will be expressed as two i squared six. Now in some cases, and this is a number that came up when we were looking at that earlier problem from the homework. We had the square root of negative 31, and on the previous section we said we didn't want to worry about it, we just said there was no real solution. Uh, it depends on the context, Gabriel. If the square root is in the problem to begin with, like we're just asked to find the square root of negative 25, we'll just write 5i. But if we ourselves introduce the square root, then we have to put the plus or minus there. It's, it's it's kind of a tricky uh, distinction that we're making there, uh, but it's a question of if the square root's there already, we assume it's positive, but if the square root hasn't been taken yet, then we can't assume whether it will be positive or negative, so we have to put both as possibilities. So here, when we're just working out uh, examples that we want to simplify, I've already given us the square root, so we'll assume that's the positive square root. Um, but when we incorporate these into the problems, absolutely they're going to be plus or minus when we solve them. Yeah. Now, the square root of negative 31. Can we split up 31 to where it's a product of 
a perfect square and something else. Well, 31 is actually a prime number. It cannot be factored any further than 1 times 31. So in this scenario, even though we can't split up the 31, we still want to make sure we take our minus sign and move that out so that we actually have an I on the outside and we'll just leave the square root of 31 underneath. Okay. So in some cases we'll be able to take the complete square root and get our answer. In other cases we'll be able to separate the term into multiple parts and simplify our answer. And in other cases we can't break down the number at all but because it is a negative underneath we want to represent that with an I instead of the negative under the radical. kind of a tricky statement you're making there, Brock, because uh, in this case, i times i is, is actually a negative number. The same rules that apply to real numbers don't necessarily apply to imaginary numbers, and that's why they're a completely different number system. It's okay. But I purposely skipped that portion because it's not, not really necessary for us to worry about that. And so what he was saying, or what we're at, what I'm saying, actually, is if we take negative one squared, that would be a negative one, or sorry, negative i squared would actually result in a negative one. Or actually even a positive one, or i squared, actually that's what I meant. i squared is negative one. So, technically both scenarios were correct. Okay, so yeah, let me find us an example to look at. I'll make one up first. Uh, for example, if we have x squared plus uh, 64 equal to 0, we want to be able to solve that. Now, when we look at that, we might think we could potentially factor it. We know if there's a minus sign between the numbers, or between the terms, this is actually a factorable expression. If we have x squared minus 64 equals 0, that means we need to find two numbers that multiply to negative 64. To zero. It's technically in between there's a zero x. So if we think about what multiplies the negative 64 and then what adds to zero, it's negative 8 times 8. Multiplies the negative 64, adds up to zero. And so that ends up be factoring as x minus 8 times x plus 8 equals 0, and so we get x equals 8, and x equals negative 8. And that one's pretty straightforward. Now, the other way we learned how to work this particular problem is we could take the 64 and add it over to the right. Okay, and say x squared is equal to 64, and then from there, we can use our square root property that we learned and say, well, let's take the square root of both sides 
And when we do that, we'll introduce a plus or minus sign on the right. And so we'll say x is plus or minus, and the square root of 64 is 8. So it's either a positive 8 or a negative 8, which corresponds to what we set up here, positive 8 or negative 8. And so that particular problem, x squared minus 64 equal to 0, could be worked either way. Now, the issue over here is we're trying to find two numbers that multiply to 64 but add up to 0. So they multiply to a positive number but somehow cancel each other out. Now, there's actually no real numbers that make that happen. In order for two, in order for two real numbers to multiply to a positive result, we either multiply a positive times a positive or a negative times a negative. And if they're either both positive or both negative, then we add them together. There's no way it equals zero in that case. So this is not factorable in the traditional traditional sense. We can still solve it. We just won't be able to factor it like we did over here. So let me just add the comment that this is not factorable. Because we can't factor it, we'll take this other approach that we talked about here, which is to move the constant over to the right hand side and then take the square root and move forward from there. The same process can still be applied. Even though we, we can't factor it, we can subtract the 64 from both sides. And they'll say x squared equals negative 64. And we'll go ahead and take the square root on both sides. And again, because we ourselves are introducing the square root to the problem, we go ahead and put the plus or minus. So the square root of x squared is x. And then the square root of negative 64, what would that be? Eight, but again, not just eight. Eight i, yes. Because it's negative, we also want to make sure we include the i there as well. So it's positive eight i or negative eight i. And that's the distinction. In this case, where we have a, what we call a sum of two squares, and a little bit off screen, sorry. Um, we have two num squares added together rather than subtracted. In this case, it's not factorable, but it ends up having imaginary solutions. Now we've talked about imaginary number uh, numbers, but now let's talk about complex numbers. These are numbers that consist of, or potentially consist of both a real and an imaginary number. Sorry about that. Okay. So 
saying that it consists of a real and imaginary number, for example, we could say 2 plus or minus 3i. We don't even need plus or minus, we can just say 2 plus 3i. Um, so we have a real number 2 and an imaginary number 3i that are being added together. And it could be added or subtracted, but that would be considered a complex number because not complex number because it has both a real number and an imaginary number put together. Oh, from the um, no, the plus minus is only here because when we we took the square root. Anytime we take the square root, we have to incorporate the plus minus. If the square root is there to begin with, we don't have to include it. So if I just asked you to find the square root of negative 4, then that's uh, 2i. Okay, That's already implied to be positive. But if we were solving x squared, equals negative 4 then in this case because we introduced the square root ourselves we ourselves take the square root of both sides we do include the plus or minus this time so x is plus or minus 2i mm -hmm. Okay, so with our complex numbers, we said it potentially consists of a real and imaginary number. Now, technically, it doesn't have to have either one. Just the two by itself is considered a complex number, even though we more specifically call it a real number. And the 3i is considered a complex number as well, uh, even though more specifically it's an imaginary number. So generally we think of complex numbers as having both parts, but the reality is that real numbers and imaginary numbers are also what we call subsets of the complex numbers. And so the complex numbers includes all real numbers and imaginary numbers as components, or as elements. So we don't necessarily have to get that specific, that's more of a, um, a set theory kind of thing that we would see in a more advanced math class, but there it is. Now, you, the main thing that we want to focus on here, don't, not so much about definitions, but making sure we work, we're able to work with these terms properly and solve problems that have these, these expressions as their result. And so speaking of which, let's go ahead and look at I'm on the wrong page, sorry. <laughs> we'll be on page 112. And let's go ahead and look at number 64. We're given x squared plus 4x plus 8 is equal to 0. Now, again, we want to just, if it's not factorable, we want to be able to go ahead and use the quadratic formula. So our processes don't really change in this section from the previous one. What's changing is the type of answers we're going to end up with. Whereas in the problems in the last section, we, we ended up with uh, real results. Now we're potentially going to get imaginary and complex results in this section. And so 
potentially we could have included them in the same section, but it's also kind of nice to, to be able to look at the imaginary numbers in a little more detail before we dive into this. Uh, there are real world applications that require imaginary numbers, but we need at least three more math classes before we get to that point, unfortunately. Yeah, we get to theoretical, even not even theoretical, actual physics or, or engineering applications. Um, uh, I actually do problems that incorporate that in differential equations which is a class that follows three semesters of calculus. Um, so I guess it's actually four more math classes before you get to that one. Um, but if you do plan on taking engineering, that's something you will have to take uh, in one way or another. So. Yeah, it's, it's, it's really hard to explain at this point without the uh, the necessary background. So we're just kind of at the starting point here, unfortunately. So we go ahead and substitute this into the quadratic formula. So we use a equals 1, b equals 4, c equals 8. So x equals negative b, so negative 4, plus or minus, and then we have the square root, and b squared, 4 squared is 16, minus 4, times a, 1, and times c, 8. We still have 2 times a on the bottom, which is 2. So, again, we resolve what's underneath the square root first. So we have 16 minus, and then 4 times 1 times 8. Uh, 4 times 1 is 4, times 8 is 32. So we end up with 16 minus 32 under the square root. So completing that subtraction, we end up with negative 16. Now, what is the square root of negative 16? Four I, mm hmm so we have negative 4 plus or minus 4i, and then divided by 2. Now, the 2 in the bottom, let's not forget, it actually divides both of the numbers that are on top, the 4, sorry, the negative 4, and also the 4i. So 2 has to divide into both of those, and if we simplify, negative 4 divided by 2 is negative 2, and then 4i divided by 2 is 2i. Now, one, one thing I wanted to mention here, and I prefer to write the answers here as a combined number, negative 2 plus or minus 2i like we see here. But in general, if you check the back of the book, for instance, they might write the answer as negative 2 plus 2i and negative 2 minus 2i as two different solutions. Well, that is also correct. We can either write them as combined using the plus minus simple or separated right into two solutions as uh, two different expressions. Uh, so whichever way you want to write that is fine. Um, on my exam, I think I write them together when you look at the answers, as mul the multiple choice questions at least. Um, although in the final, they might be written as separate ones. But I, I, 
hopefully that's one that we're comfortable enough with that it, it, we can easily recognize which case it is and, and, and still correct the, uh, still correctly choose the solution. So yeah, a problem like this I might present as a, a multiple choice question on the test and give you four different answers A, B, C, D, and uh, you'll have to pick out the correct one. But whenever we get to our test, we'll have a combination of multiple chance, uh, multiple choice and show your work problems. Um, And what you have to do for the show your work problems is uh, upload an image or scan of your work on paper. So hopefully everyone has the means to do that. Does the order matter? Well, and actually that's a, a good question. Normally, like when it's a whole number here, we would, or, or, or sorry, when there's no square root present, then we'll write the real number first and the imaginary component last. But you might have noticed in previous examples, I might have said i, or, or sorry, 2i times the square root of 6. We wrote that as uh, the square root of negative 24, I believe. Another way we could express that is 2 square root of 6 times i, keeping the imaginary part last and the real part first. And technically, this is correct as well. I tend to favor this format because whenever we write the i like this, it looks like the i might be part of the square root, or maybe it's hard to tell. And I want to clearly show that the i is on the outside of the square root rather than being part of it. So that's why I always write it in this form. But yeah, we can switch that up and it'll still be correct. Um, especially in a case like this, like we had the negative square root of negative 31 example. Basically, those could be written in either order. Okay. Are there any other questions? So for homework today, again just for practice, but uh, look at page 112, 59 through 69, just the odd problems there. Okay. So you do 59, 61, 63, 65, 67, and 69. Does anyone have any other questions? I'll give you a second to type them in. This is where I don't like the delay between the video and the, and the chat, unfortunately. So, luckily, it's only like five seconds or so. All right, uh, so I think we'll leave it at that for today. Um, so go ahead and practice these problems. Hopefully they go pretty well. And on uh, Wednesday, we'll go ahead and look at section 1.4. All right. 
Well, y'all have a good rest of the day, and uh, I will talk to y'all again on Wednesday. Have a good day, yeah.